good afternoon everyone i hope you all are doing fine and guess what today we are going to discuss new criticism as you can see over your screen but let me tell you before what we have discussed so far in our previous session we we talked about deconstruction we also talked about the structuralism post structuralism and of course a reader response theory right and in this particular session we are going to talk about new criticism so tell me if you all are ready for that well i'm pretty excited because it's really good and these days what happens everybody use these kind of new criticism to interpret a particular literary text right so first off what's new criticism well it's a type of literary theory and it's all about analyzing literary works for what actually written on the page so forget about the author's personal life or intention here it's all about the text so instead new criticism is all about close reading especially when it comes to poetry we're talking about really digging deep into the text to figure out how literature functions as a self contained self referential piece of art so just forget about whatever is about the author or his by background all these things is not necessary when you are doing new criticism so if you're asking where did this whole new criticism thing get its name so thanks to jc ransom and his 1941 book the new criticism he is the one who really helped this movement to take off but before ransom there was i a richards and his ground breaking work practical criticism that we are going to discuss soon and it was published in 1929 and this book was a game changer because it claimed to use a scientific approach to literary interpretation in fact richards is also often called what the father of new criticism he was one of the first to treat literary analysis as a science which was pretty revolutionary back then T.S. Eliot, another one, is a heavyweight as we know in the world of literature. He also played a significant role in new criticism too. He came up with this idea called the theory of impersonality, which basically says that the poet's personality shouldn't overshadow the poem itself. And Eliot gave us another gem concept that is called objective correlative, which is a way of expressing emotions through the object and events in a story or poem it's like using symbols to convey feelings and eliot didn't stop there he had some strong opinion about other poets he wasn't too keen on milton and dryden but he had a soft spot for what he called the metaphysical poem or poets so he really shaped the new criticism canon with his evaluation so guys that was all new criticism in a nutshell it's all about close reading looking at the text itself and not getting bothered about the author's life story or intentions now let's move quickly to jc ransom as you can see over your screen the guy with the hat and a black coat right this is your guy jc ransom and why he is important because of the work criticism incorporated in 1937 but let's first talk about who is jc ransom by the way this guy was a true renaissance man in the literary world dabbling in poetry criticism essays and even editing now what really makes ransom the stand out is that he is often called the founding father of new criticism school of literary criticism and believe me that's not just a catchy name it's a whole new philosophy so ransom was also a professor sharing his wisdom at kenyan college which is a pretty big deal in the academic world 
and if you're into literary magazine you should know that he was the first editor of the highly esteemed kenyan review you can see over your screen in his essay criticism incorporate back in 1937 ransom laid down some rules and he believed criticism needed to become more precise and scientific he wanted literary critics to see a poem as an aesthetic object something to be admired for its beauty so this particular work and a bunch of ransom other essays like the new critics playbook they set the rules that this is school of thought follows and here's a fun fact that some of Ransom's students, folk like Alan Tate and Clint Brook, played a significant role in shaping new criticism into what it became. And guess what? And if you're feeling extra curious and want to do some serious literary exploration, you might want to check out other Ransom works like The World's Body and God Without Thunder. But anyway, that was all about J.C. Ransom and let's move quickly to another titans in literary criticism, I.E. Richards. So let's talk about I.E. Richards, what he was and how he got inspired by all these things, right? So as you can see, a guy sitting in a mountain and looking at somewhere and thinking, I don't know what seems like he's sitting in Mount Everest, Mount Everest, right? But anyway, leave that thing. Let's quickly come back to I.A. Richard. So I think he's the English educator and literary critic who shook things up with his ideas and laid the groundwork for what we now call new criticism. And as I told you, new criticism is all about what to look at text closely simple as that so these fox including richards were all about that close reading of literary text especially poetry they wanted to peel back the layers and figure out how a piece of literature works as this self-contained self-referential aesthetic object it's all about looking deep into the text itself and guess what? Richard is often called what? The father of, or should I say, a dad of new criticism. So he was one of the first cats to treat literary interpretation like a science. He was like, what's going on when we read a text? What techniques are we using? And how can we study those techniques? Richard had this idea that four factors are in the mix when we are trying to figure out what a word really means. First, you have got sense, right? Which is the literal meaning of the word. Another, we have feeling, which is the emotional vibe it brings. And another is tone, which sets the mood. And eventually we have intention, which is what the author is trying to get across. But that's not all Falk. Richards wasn't a one-man show. He teamed up with C.K. Ogden and a linguistic philosopher and writer in some pretty cool book collaboration. As you can see the list here, especially this particular slide is about collaboration with C.K. Ogden. So first book, as you can see, The Foundation of Aesthetics in 1922 where they spilled the beans on the principles of aesthetic reception and the harmony of literary theory then came another the meaning of meaning a study of influence of language upon thought of the science of symbolism which was published in 1923 they were basically what exploring how language messes up with our thinking and in 1930, they dropped what very important thing, basic English, a general introduction with rules and grammar. This one was all about creating this simplified version of English with a vocabulary of just 850 words. 
and guess what based on that we already got like so many questions based on that so in that way this particular 850 words is quite important because in exam they have been actually asking about this particular thing but in the future they might ask once again so remember that 850 words with ck ogden and i richard so remember this but anyway this was all about i richard's collaboration with ck ogden now we'll quickly move to what principles of literary criticism and of course practical criticism first we'll talk about principle of criticism so this is one of his major works which is principle of literary criticism which was published around 1925 in this book what happens Richards goes deep into how our minds respond to the rhythm and meter of poetry think of it as a guide to understanding the musicality of literature the Richard theory is all about context he argues that the sound effect of poetry like a rhythm have a significant psychological impact it's not just about words, it's about how they make us feel. In his book, he also talks about various aspects of literature like form, value, rhythm and literary infectiousness. It's like dissecting the DNA of a good story. Richards also dwells into how literature can be elusive. That means it often refers to other works creating a web of connection in the literary world. He's all about diverse readings. Richard believed that a single piece of literature actually can be interpreted in many different ways, depending on reader's perspective. But here again, another interesting thing that Richard is also interested in how literature makes us believe in things. It's like the magic of a storytelling that convinces us to suspend disbelief and dive into a fictional world. He famously said, a book is a machine to think with. So literature isn't just about entertainment. It's a tool for deep thinking, but he's a quick to point out that if it shouldn't replace actual machine like locomotive. So remember that particular one, because once I saw one question based on that also what locomotive that word but anyway uh, let's talk about now practical criticism as you can see it was published in 1929 and this one is particular very fascinating so richards as a teacher at cambridge university he conducted an experiment and he handed his student 13 poems Remember the number 13 points with no information about the authors or the context. It was all about raw, unfiltered response to the text. So this particular experiment reveals something incredible. And guess what? The sheer variety and depth of interpretations that the students could come up with when they read a text without any background information. So Richards also didn't stop there. He introduced various theories like metaphor value, tone, stock response, incipient action, pseudo statement and ambiguity theories. So in a nutshell, I.A. Richards was a literary superstar who showed us that literature isn't just the words on a page. It's a symphony of sound and meaning that can be interpreted in countless ways. So the next time when you grab a good book, remember that Richards and his profound insights into the art of reading and critique literature. Right. So that was all about I.A. Richard. Let's quickly move to another titan in literary new criticism uh, that is WK Wimsat and Monroe. Everybody must have heard about intentional fallacy and effective fallacy, right? 
and you would want to know more about it you would want to explore more about it so guys there you have it on your screen everything about intentional effective fallacy and along with that we have a little bit two more terms that you can see below concrete universal domain of criticism but let's move forward all right friends imagine you're in a cozy class sipping on your coffee and discussing a poem you might be tempted to bring in the author's live story or how the poem made you feel well that's where wimsat and beardsley come in with their concept of the intentional fallacy and the effective fallacy so we have got this intentional fallacy this is all about avoiding the confusion between a poem and where it came from see sometimes people get so caught up in the author's personal life or what was going on in their head when they wrote the poem right but wimsad and beardsley said hold on a minute they argue that this is a fallacy because in reality we can't always know what was going on in an author's mind and when they wrote something and there also in this particular uh, fallacy we have genetic fallacy as well now they also mention something called this genetic fallacy which is basically the same thing but in philosophy it's when you judge an idea based on where it came from rather than its actual content so they're saying kind of don't get too hung up on where the poem or idea came from what actually you should do focus on the work itself so that is another if you would ask me that is synonyms of intentional fallacy that genetic fallacy so remember that and another term is called subjective territory the reason they called it a fallacy is that relying on an author's intention can lead us down a subjective rabbit hole different readers might interpret an author's intention in various ways and authors themselves might not even fully understand what they were trying to convey so instead of being objective our criticism becomes all about personal interpretation now you can see another effective fallacy in simpler word what is that confusion between the poems and its result and its effect moving on to the effective fallacy this one deals with the idea of judging a text based on how it makes you feel it's like saying i loved this particular poem so it must be brilliant but wimsett and beardsley said hold your horses guys they argue that this is a fallacy because it mixes up the poem itself with the feelings it evokes in readers and if you put it another way affective fallacy can come into the reader response theory because the affective fallacy is kind of like saying the reader's response to a poem determines what it's worth but our dynamic duo argue that this is another form of confusion between the poem and its results so guys there you have it it's all about vk wimsat munro beardsley and they were all about keeping our analysis of literature clear and focused they reminded us not to get tangled up in author's intention or our emotional reaction instead they encouraged us to explore the actual content of the work itself so again next time when you are discussing a poem with your friend or with your teacher or professor remember these fallacy you see there are two more terms like concrete universal and domain of criticism so they didn't ask many questions related to these two terms but we have put it we should be one step ahead of the examiner right so wimsett is basically what pondering whether word should be super specific or kind of general to be effective in literature think about it like this if you describe something as a purple cow you are giving us a very vivid picture right purple cow but what if you say it's a tan cow with a broken horn what happens now you are getting into the 
nitty gritty details of the particular thing so vimsad is wondering which approach is better when it comes to writing should we go all about with specifics or is there beauty in leaving a bit of room for imagination the next term you see the domain of criticism and here vimsad also takes a swing at the big question of where poetry fits into the world of aesthetics see he is not convinced that poetry can be neatly packed into the same box as paintings or as sculpture when we talk about aesthetic he is like hold on a second can we really judge a poem in the same way we judge a gorgeous painting he has got some doubts and he is here to challenge us to think about it too so next we have f r lewis and his new bearings in english poetry and of course the great tradition that we'll talk in our next slide but first we should know that f r lewis was a prominent english literary critic known for his sharp insights into literature notably he and his wife collaborated on new bearings in english poetry a significant work in their literary journey they also co-founded the literary magazine as you can see here scrutiny in 1932 where they examined literature in depth this power couple was dedicated to unraveling the intricacies of literature lewis had a unique approach to literature guys he believed in objective analysis leaving no room for fluffing according to him the ultimate goal of literature was to make us feel more humane and civilized like a finishing school for the soul remember that he championed close reading well if you thinking close reading is like literally putting your nose onto the page it's not guys but scrutinizing every word and nuances leave is dissected literature like a scientist delving into its core to uncover hidden meanings so scrutiny wasn't just a fancy name it was a serious literary review where they left no stone unturned and lewis magnum opus here the new bearing in literature offered us a glimpse into this critical genius which is a kind of must read for literature enthusiasts he had ties with the american new critics who shared his passion for close reading intense and poetic analysis again lewis's focus in new bearing was on the poetry giants of his time and guess who were they G. M. Hopkins, W. B. Yeats, T. S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, and what his mission was to uncover the most remarkable and vital aspects of modern poetry. Now let's talk about the Great Tradition, which was published in 1948. It was like his literary roadmap, guiding us through the finest English novelist he could think of. So, guys, let me ask you one thing: Can you guess who made it onto his A list? write it in your comment box well let me tell you there were some heavy wets like jane austen george eliot henry james and joseph conrad so according to lewis what these folks weren't just writers they were literary giants lewis even went as far as to say that these novelists were the successor of none other than the legendary shakespeare himself but the list didn't stop there it also included charles dickens nathaniel hawthorne herman melville and our edgar allan poe so these guys were like the modern day shakespearean disciples now here's where it really gets interesting as time went on leaves decided to invite d h lawrence to this elite group of literary luminaries lawrence was like the new kid on the block bringing fresh perspectives to the table but hold on a second because lewis wasn't entirely sold on charles dickens and that question you always get in that well except for one of his works hard times you see lewis thought dickens was a fantastic entertainer but he believed that dickens sometime fell short in the deep mature storytelling department compared to henry james Lewis was big on melodrama too. He took a close look at how melodrama was used in the novels of Joseph Conrad, highlighting the differences and nuances in their approaches. 
while lewis acknowledged that dickens was undoubtedly a classic he felt that dickens didn't always dive as deep into the complexity of life and art as some of the other novelists on his list so in lewis world jean austen was like the queen of this literary kingdom he believed that she along with the gangs of novelist he admired didn't just write stories they changed the very game of art opened our eyes to new possibilities in life now let's talk about another new critic titan if you may say clent brook and as we know clent brook was an american literary guru who rocked the world of poetry analysis well some of his most famous pieces are the well wrought on which was published in 1947 and modern poetry and the tradition back in 1939 now you are asking what did this guy stand for actually right well brooks was all about embracing the fuzzy stuff in poetry ambiguity and paradox he thought these were the keys to unlocking the mystery of verse brooks was one of the pioneer of formalist criticism that's just a fancy word of saying he was all about digging into the nitty gritty of a poem's interior life in simpler word he was the sherlock holmes of poetry and guess what brooks was like the head honcho when it came to critiquing william faulkner he knew faulkner's work inside out guys like the back of his hand and let's not forget he joined forces with robert pen warren to create what the southern review a journal that shook things up in the literary world so let me tell you one more time new criticism it's this whole movement that brooks was a big part of it and these fox believed in dissecting text looking at their structure and reading every word like it's a secret code forget about history or the author's biography they wanted to get up close and personal with the text itself so author's biography doesn't matter in the well wrought on brooks tells us that close reading is where it's at you have got to examine what the poem says not what you think it might mean in historical context and here's a golden nugget for you guys brooks thought that the heart and soul of new criticism was all about the work itself forget about everything else it's all about what's on these pages in one of his pieces the formalist critics brooks lays out his belief it's like his personal code of conduct of poetry analysis well guys this the well wrought on the full title you can see here studies in the structure of poetry well this book as you know it was published in 1947 holds a special place in the heart of literary criticism why particularly among the new critics right so this the well wrought on isn't your kind of typical book it's a collection of essays a gathering of profound thoughts about poetry penned by some of the sharpest minds in the field which feel in the world of literary criticism especially among the new critics it shines like a guiding star now you might be wondering about that intriguing title right it's actually from john dunn's poem the canonization so remember that and which takes center stage in the book's first chapter itself this poem becomes a canvas for the authors to explore the intricacy of poetry speaking of chapter this book comes with 11 of them right and 10 chapters takes us on an adventure through english poems ranging from shakespeare's macbeth to yeats among his school children it's like a literary journey through time and space but again hold on your seats because this 11th chapter no it's very important it is where things get truly exciting it's called the hearsay of paraphrase and 
you get many questions based on this particular word right the hearsay of paraphrase and it's famous in the world of literary criticism as you know and that's why it becomes very important in your exam and you and now you can ask me why it's very important well guys because it's a battle of cry against paraphrasing in poetry analysis in a sense it says hey don't you dare try to sum up a poem in a plain language well guys it's a reminder that poetry is meant to be appreciated for its depth and complexity so after that 11th chapter you'll find two appendices and that delve into topics like criticism history and the tricky concept of belief they're like bonus rounds in this literary adventure so most of the focus on is on close readings of poem by some literary superstars like dun shakespeare milton pope wordsworth keats lord tennyson yeats thomas gray and our t s eliot so these poems serve as the concrete examples on which the author based their generalization about poetry now let's talk about the hearsay of paraphrase as you can see at the right side of your screen the hearsay of paraphrase right well this hearsay of paraphrase was from this book itself the well brought on and remember the chapter name 13th right so again this chapter challenges some deeply rooted ideas about poetry and now let me break it down into these points and you can see over your screen right so brooks firmly believed that poetry couldn't be boiled down to a simple one size fits all meaning right to him a genuine poem was more than just words on a page it was a mirror of reality an experience in itself he emphasized the importance of looking beyond the literal meaning of words and focusing on the structure tension balance and irony within a poem one of the central arguments brooks made that you couldn't strip a poem of its unique form and translate its meaning directly into another format like a straight forward paraphrase and that's exactly what happened in our education right we get a poem and then we paraphrase uh, all or we make analysis and all these things in one or two paragraph well according to him it should be not like that so what he says the essence of poem was intricately tied to how it was structured this viewpoint shatter the traditional notion that you could neatly separate a poem's form from its content so in the hearsay of paraphrase brooks criticized the conventional way of distinguishing between po poem's content and of course its form and he argued critics to delve into the patterns and intricacies of poem rather than attempting to simplify and explain its content in plain language this radical approach to poetry analysis was part of the larger moment as we know that we are discussing new criticism right and it actually emerged during a time when t s eliot who is a renowned poet and critic was making significant waves in the literary world Now let's talk about Robert Penn Warren, another literary heavyweight who was a poet, novelist, critic, and one of the pioneering mind behind the new criticism. Warren's literary journey was nothing short of extraordinary. He waded into multiple literary arenas and left an incredible mark. Most notably, he is often celebrated as one of the founding architect of new criticism right and that new criticism is a was kind of literary movement that forever changed how we analyzed and interpret text so new criticism zoomed in on the text itself extracting meaning and nuances from its very words in 1935 varen co-founded the southern review a prestigious literary journal that became a platform for some of the finest literary works emerging from the american south 
This journal showcases the depth and diversity of Southern literature, further establishing Warren as a significant figure in the American literary landscape. But perhaps what sets Robert Penn Warren apart in the Literary Hall of Fame is his astounding achievement of winning not one, not two guys, but three Pulitzer Prizes. And this is the equivalent of hitting the literary jackpot three times over. As you know, his novel All the King's Men, 1947, thrust readers into a gripping narrative that was deep into the moral dilemma of the American South. Again, another was Promises, which was published in 1958, and Now and Then, which was again published in 20 years later, 1978, are the other two Pulitzer winning gems, and both continuing the tradition of exploring profound moral dilemmas. Here's the incredible twist that Robert Penn Warren is the only person to have ever won Pulitzer Prize in both fiction and poetry. This is like again winning both the Super Bowl and the World Cup, right? In a single year, guys. So a rare and extraordinary accomplished, I must say. But Warren's influence doesn't stop at his own work. He co-authored Understanding Poetry which was published in 1938 with Glenn This was a textbook that transformed how poetry was taught in American colleges. This book didn't just teach students what a poem means. It taught them how it means. It was a seismic shift in literary analysis and it's a reverberation are still felt today. Understanding poetry wasn't merely a book. It was a literary revolution, guys. It fundamentally altered how literature was studied at university, pushing aside older, less nuanced approaches in favor of new criticism pioneered by Warren and his contemporary. Imagine being a part of a movement that reshaped an entire field of study. So guys, that was all about Robert Penn Warren and his understanding poetry. Let's move quickly to our Titan and who is T.S. Eliot. We'll start with tradition and the individual talent and then we'll move on to Hamlet and his problem. So well, let's discuss about uh, his life a little bit. We won't take much time. Don't worry about it. So Eliot is actually hailed from St. Louis, Missouri. Right, but eventually made his poetic home across the pond in London, England, where he spent his final days. Now, when it comes to poetry, Eliot was the big kind of giant of the modernist movement. You might have heard of some of his masterpieces, right, like The Wasteland and The Four Quarters and many more. And these works shook up the poetry scene like a good thunderstorm. Eliot's influence wasn't limited to just literary words like poetry, drama. It seeped into Anglo-American culture like tea in a cup. In recognition of his literary prov, he received some of the highest honors out there, guys, like the Order of Merit and, of course, the Nobel Prize for Literature. And can you guess the date? Right in the chat box. That's like winning an Oscar, Grammy and Nobel Prize rolled into one of the world of literature. Now let's talk about one of his famous essay here. That will be our focus, Tradition and the Individual Talent. And remember that this was actually published in The Sacred Wood, Essay on Poetry and Criticism in 1920. In a nutshell, this two, Tradition and Individual Talent, is divided into three parts. First up, you have got the concept of tradition. Eliot dives into what tradition means in poetry. Then there is the theory of impersonal poetry. Now, this might sound a bit strange, but Eliot argues that poets should sort of disappear into their work. It's not about them. It's about the poetry itself. Lastly, Eliot wraps it all with a conclusion. 
he ties everything together and leaves you with some food for thought about tradition poetry and the role of individual poet in the grand scheme of things now let's talk about the concept of tradition as you can see over your screen you have like 10 points there maybe more than that we'll move we'll talk about it one by one so t.s Eliot's idea of tradition and what it means for poet and poetry is that Eliot had some pretty cool thoughts on this topic and we are about to break it down so Eliot felt that poetry didn't give tradition the love it deserved in literature instead they often criticized it he saw it as this hidden gem in literary criticism waiting to be discovered now when Eliot's talk about tradition he doesn't mean just following old stuff blindly no guys he makes it all fancy and calls it a simultaneous order basically it's this blend of past and present you have got the wisdom of the old days mixed with the freshness of today right he takes it a step further and calls this whole european literary journey from the days of homer the mind of europe and it's like the collective brain power of continent expressed through words now here's the cool part guys Eliot didn't buy into the idea that you're born genius especially when it comes to art no what he actually believed he believed that talent comes from hard work and is studying poetry he drops this line that's worth remembering tradition cannot be inherited and if you want it you must obtain it by great labor now let's talk about the theory of impersonal poetry so this the theory of impersonal poetry as seen through the eyes of T.S. Eliot now let's break it down so Eliot had this idea that poetry should be kind of impersonal like separate from the poet's own personality he thought that when poets create they sort of give up a piece of themselves and tap into the big old tradition of poetry it's almost like being a scientist mixing chemical in a lab in this case the chemicals are feelings and emotions and the poet's job is to mix them up and create a work of art that shows those feeling and emotions but it's not about the raw feelings themselves it's about the process of mixing them together into something beautiful so remember that he compared poet as chemist so Eliot had this phrase again escape from emotions very important guys which means he believed that poetry wasn't about just pouring out your feelings onto the page it was more like crafting something that helps others feel and understand those emotions in his essay Eliot had two big goals first he wanted to stress how important history is when it came to poetry and he thought you couldn't really get poetry without understanding where it came from and which is its history and then again he brought up this idea of impersonal poet it's kind of like how john keats talk about a chameleon poet so remember that they ask this in exam most of the time chameleon or chameleon as you can see in your screen it was actually mentioned in the theory of impersonal poetry so Eliot's impersonal poet is like a so Eliot's impersonal poet is a bit like that sort of a poet who not all about themselves but about the bigger picture of poetry itself so guys that was all about tradition and the individual talent in short i hope you understand and i hope i have covered everything in it and let me tell you one thing they don't ask more than that in your exam so that's enough now let's talk about hamlet and his problem which was published in 1919 and this particular essay is my favorite and i'll tell you why well this essay we know it as hamlet and his problem is a bit of a head turner first off it's important to know that this essay came out in 1919 very important date guys that you should remember and remember it was also published in a book of essays called the sacred wood in 1920 quite important to remember 
Now here's the interesting part. If you're expecting that Iliad might have showered so much praises over Hamlet, but it's not guys. He boldly declared that it's well, let's say, not Shakespeare's finest hour. Can you believe it? So he famously called it an artistic failure. Kind of pretty harsh, right? But anyway, that very important phrase that you should remember that he called Hamlet is what artistic failure. Iliad is also known for bringing up something called the objective correlative. You see this fancy term is actually a tool to stir up emotions in the audience. Like when you see a character in a movie cry when their pet goldfish dies or their dog dies or anything, you feel sad too, right? And that's exactly the objective correlative at work. And this essay of Iliad is a big deal in a literary movement called new criticism and it's like the cool new way of thinking at literature right where you don't just care about what's happening in the story you're all about how it's written so Iliad starts off by saying that the main issue with Hamlet isn't really Hamlet or that major character or that protagonist is actually the whole play itself he argues that Hamlet's character gets too much attention and that creative critics basically projects themselves onto him. It's like when you meet someone who thinks they are the real life Hamlet. Well, Iliad wasn't a fan of that. He even points finger at Goethe and Coleridge because these two big literary figures talked about Hamlet and Iliad actually what accuses Goethe of turning Shakespeare's Hamlet into his own character, which he calls Pwertha. And I think you must have heard about this Goethe's work, The Sorrow of Young Werther, right? So again, he again attacked Coleridge and says that Coleridge isn't spared either. He claims Coleridge made Hamlet into a mini Coleridge. So Eliot thinks this sort of criticism is a way off the mark. Instead, he gives a nod to J.M. Robertson. He support, supported J.M. Robertson and Almer Edgar Stoll for taking a broader view of the play. He's all about looking at the bigger picture. Now, Shakespeare didn't pull Hamlet actually out of thin air. Iliad says that Shakespeare had some inspiration, like it was taken from uh, Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy and sometime it called the Ur Hamlet and there is even a version of Hamlet itself which was actually performed in Germany when Shakespeare was alive and at the end Iliad wraps things up by agreeing with Robert Chen and who believed that Hamlet's motivation was more about his mom's guilt than just plain old revenge for his dad. Shakespeare, according to Iliad, didn't quite nail the mix of emotion and source material. So guys, that's where this objective correlative thing comes in. And Iliad says it's all about making the external stuff in the play match up perfectly with the emotions. Basically, Shakespeare didn't quite hit the bullseye with Hamlet because he struggled to express Hamlet's feeling in his surroundings. And to top it off, the audience couldn't quite pinpoint those emotions either. So, Iliad is right when he says that Hamlet is an artistic failure. Right? Alright folks, let's dive into the world of Sir William Ambition. He's a kind of uh, English literary guru who made us see literature in a whole new light. This guy was not just a critic, he was also a poet and his knack for picking apart words and meanings laid the foundation for a whole new movement called New Criticism. Now, Emshan's claim to fame in his 1930 masterpiece, Seven Types of Ambiguity. So, this book wasn't just a hit, it was a game changer in the world of literary criticism. What's it all about, you ask, right? Well, Ambition basically decided to be a literary detective and hunt down seven different flavors of ambiguity in poetry. And let me tell you, he loved him 
some ambiguity first up there is this thing called metaphor and it's like when poets say one thing is like another right but they are totally different imagine comparing love to a battlefield that's a metaphor and i'm sure dug those and then second you can see he got into the fancy stuff with two or more meanings or resolved into one right this is like when a poet tosses two metaphor at you at the same time and you have got to figure out how they fit together it's like a brain workout and that is metaphysical conceit next there we have unconnected meaning this is when two ideas that don't seem related are smashed into one word you have got to put on your thinking cap for that one too next we have alternative meanings and it is like when a poet's got a bunch of different ideas and they are all jumbled together it's like they're saying hey i can't decide so here you figure it out and again uh, emerson also like to talk about fortunate confusion and that is when the author is writing and suddenly they stumbled upon a brilliant idea it's like a light bulb moment in the middle of a sentence and there is next contradictory or irrelevant interpretation or when a poet says something that's so vague or meaningless that you have got to come up with your own version of it it's like they're playing a mind game with you guys last but not least we have got full contradiction this is when the author uses two words that are total opposite and it's like they're showing you the battle inside their own minds so in a nutshell sir william emshin was the sherlock holmes of literary analysis finding hidden meanings and mysteries in the words of poets his seven types of ambiguity was like a treasure map for literary scholar and it forever changed the way we look at poetry next we have qd lewis and again she was an english literary critic and essayist uh, she came from a jewish family and married to f r lewis and she was unsympathetic to the feminist movement and attacked virginia woolf's feminist polemic three guineas and remember why she is important here in literary criticism especially new criticism that she contributed to and supported an editor scrutiny remember that it's very important so guys that's all now we'll move to our conclusion so so far we have learned about jc ransom i richard vk wk wimsat and munro piatsley of course fr lewis clint brook robert penwaren t s eliot q d lewis and of course sir william emson so we have to appreciate all these contribution of these giants to the field of literary criticism right from i richards to the principle of criticism to v w k wimsat and munro piatsley intentional and effective fallacy and of course t s eliot's tradition in individual talent and as i told you my favorite hamlet and his problem so guys that was all right amazing journey and we have learned all about new criticism and i hope you have got all the idea what it is really about so guys thank you so much and i'll see you in our next session where we'll discuss about new historicism so thank you so much and good night bye bye